a number of us have long believed that the liveliest introduction to Japanese history, ignoring the chronology and the various periods, which tend to be confusing, would be visual. We would look at Japanese art, and through the art, the history. This would include the early remarkable aesthetic taste of the Japanese people. It would certainly stress the continuity of the Japanese history as seen through its art, and would certainly embrace the staying power of tradition amidst what appears to be a very modern lifestyle in Japan today. Americans, of course, have grown used to experience of Japanese culture indirectly through Japanese restaurants and artistic table settings in both New York and throughout California, the Japanese-style stores like the Takashimaya in New York, and transported artifacts such as the Buddhist temple in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Then most recently in Washington and New York, Americans had the opportunity to see the celebrated Japanese Grand Kabuki Theater which, as we will see in a moment, was the model for the woodblock prints. And many Americans now understand also the major themes in art and Japanese history. Whereas Americans often build ranch houses with picture windows looking out on other ranch houses with their picture windows, the Japanese always try to use picture windows to frame a picture. From the very beginning, they have been moved by the Japanese art has had an intimate connection with nature. Finally, from the earliest grades to adulthood, the Japanese learn visual art from the reach of history. For example, each fall in Kyoto, the older capital, a great historical festival called the Festival of Ages, the Jidai Matsuri, winds its way through the city, and the splendid tradition of art is held up for schoolchildren and for the hordes of tourists. Now, we would begin our visual survey in myth and legend and at best what we call prehistory, before the time about the 17th century when Chinese influence overwhelmed the Japanese. What we will call the indigenous cult, what the author Langdon Warner in his book, The Enduring Art of Japan, called Shinto, Nurse of the Arts. It was based on the Japanese concept of all natural forces and laws and the absurd fact that these could frequently, to a degree, be controlled by priests or adepts. Thus, according to Shinto, the very air of Japan was crowded with a host of presences. These were the superiors, the upper level, the kami, also linked with the nearer generations of the family dead. And they made up the foundations of what was at first a primitive cult called Shinto. Sir George Sansom, the great British historian, estimated that by late uh, 8th century, there were already more than 3,000 officially recognized shrines tucked away in the countryside. And soon these beliefs took on the form of religion. Surviving art, incidentally, informs us that what was to become the religion of the imperial family, still reigning in Japan, uh, was not its monopoly. Some of the finest existent architecture celebrated other gods or other kami. For example, the magnificent primitive Izumo Taisha shrine in Shimane Prefecture, over on the Japan seacoast nearest to Korea. Ritualized remains are, however, now linked with the still reigning imperial house at the old mother shrine at Ise where regularly reconstruction of the shrine is carried out in the archaic style. Thus one can see the actual ancient methods of carpentry, and finally the simple, austere Shinto classic style. Ever since the 8th century, Shinto has been the way of the artist. Natural forces are the subject matter for those who produce anything. The correct, we'd say, necessarily the religious way to build a house is to face it to the south toward the life-giving sun. Or the religious way to brew sake has been from the earliest times imbued with peculiar guarantee of success through dependence on divine formula and a divine patron who establishes rules. Naturally, some of Japan's first potters had this blessing and made pots for the Shinto shrines. For example, the ancient pottery at Bizencho in Okayama, southern Japan, which has been making pottery since uh, bef before history. 
Now the modern potter too knows just the right combination of clay and water, fire and wood, shape and decoration, and what we might call superstition or rule of thumb becomes uh, the principle for the maturing of yeast in sake, the making of beer, the netting of bread, the forging of iron, the planting, maturing, and harvesting of rice. What was once a folk chant, a liturgy in rice planting, becomes stylized and staged. It moves up into a number in a review and eventually a part of the classic Grand Kabuki Theater. About the 7th, 8th century, the first real capital was established in Japan in uh, what is still today a magnificent museum city built on the lush Yamato Plain, the heart of the old rice culture, around what was now called uh, Nara. On this plain and on the hills both east and west were set great monasteries in their parks and one could see the pagodas from the rice paddies. The town was laid out in a grid modeled after the great Chinese metropolitan capital Chang'an, the capital of Tang, China. Doubtless the very first artifacts were indeed Chinese, brought in from the great Tang dynasties. But the structures, a fact the Japanese often uh, overlook, were erected by Korean craftsmen working with clay. Japanese helpers soon learned to make tiled roofs in place of the old Shinto thatch with corner posts and Chinese vermilion. The stupa, working its way from India through Southeast Asia and around across China and Korea to Japan, became the graceful multi-storied pagoda. Incidentally, Nara is not the only, but it is only one of a very few remaining monuments to the era. When uh, Japanese and Korean carpenters finished in Nara, they went home throughout the countryside in remote Japan and constructed whole towns some are now protected as national treasures, like the famous ski resort up in the Japan Alps called Takayama. The advent of Buddhism, conventionally dated about the 6th century, 552 AD, brought with it from the continent not only religion, but Confucianism and Taoism, different systems of thought, Chinese language and literature. But only a half a dozen paintings, some liturgical paraphernalia, and a few artifacts remain. Some of these earliest pieces are still linked with the imperial house, uh, lacquer boxes, for example, and they're now stored in the Shosoin in Nara, which is in fact a log structure ingeniously designed to let dry air in and to keep damaging or wet air out. The logs, in other words, contract and expand depending upon the humidity. In any case, we have less than 300 Buddhist statues of clay, lacquer, bronze, and wood. Already the Japanese, however, were adapting from the original. Ornate Indian and Chinese fat Buddhas thus became slim, graceful figures in the Maitreya style, which were distinctively Japanese. Langdon, wrote, Langdon Warner wrote further, nature suggested the materials used by artists and the limitations which cramped him. Thus the volcanic islands yielded little stone for building and next to none for sculpture, but hard and soft wood grew there abundantly. Artists' pigments were to be found in the minerals and a full dyer's palette in flowers, barks, lichens, and, bar and roots. Clay for the modelers and the potters could be found under the shingle of any river branch. These then became the classic art materials of Japan. And as we've seen, the Chinese influence was truly overwhelming. The next period centered around the second oldest capital, Kyoto. History records how about 794, the capital was moved to a great basin to the north of Nara, a basin surrounded by mountains. The city was again modeled on the Chinese metropolitan capital, Chang'an, and the city in those days was called Heian-kyo, the capital of peace. Today we know it as Kyoto, a magnificent museum city which, like Nara, was never bombed in World War II. 
It's on the banks of the Kamo River and still gives us a marvelous vision of what an older Japanese city looked like. The name of the art period follows that of a very famous family of civil regents known as the Fujiwara, who dominated the throne until the 12th century. They never usurped the throne, they never sat on the throne, but their daughters married into the imperial family and became empresses. Nor did they lose touch with their past. In Nara, we can find a great Shinto shrine, the Kasuga Jinja, which symbolized their grasp of the earlier Shinto priesthood. The Fujiwara was above all the Chinese period. Indeed, one could be forgiven for believing that Japan became Chinified, or Sinified, as we say, as described in the famous novel by the Lady Murasaki, The Tale of Genji. Life at the court, at least, became stifling, markedly precious, gossamer, and dreamlike. Perhaps most significant from this period, just outside uh, Kyoto, was the great Itsukushima Shinto Shrine, just south of the modern city of Hiroshima. With its island park, so remindful of Chinese landscaping, and its celebrated tori, or great gate, out in the water. This, by the way, was the backdrop of Japan's first great color motion picture, The Gate of Hell. The shrine, the scene of many events, involved the Taira clan and the upstart Minamoto clan to the east with their military headquarters at Kamakura. And that brings us to the next period, the Kamakura, dominated by the Minamoto family, local clans supported by large samurai armies headed by a shogun, in this case a Minamoto family person, were laying down thoroughly Japanese foundations in the countryside to the east specifically a military headquarters at Kamakura, which today is a bedroom suburb of Tokyo and another museum city, but within a 50-minute electric train ride from Tokyo's central station. Here, the victorious bushi, or samurai, dedicated their shrine and temple to the god of war, Hachiman. But the shrines retained much that was uh, Shinto, even the quiet iconography of Buddhism took on the fierce characteristics of the samurai. This was a period, by the way, of high art in wooden sculpture, some of the finest in the world. It was vivid, it was lively, as contrasted to the gossamer film-like Kyoto. Although Kamakura was a period of consolidation, the era was also the beginning of a long period of endemic warfare. This takes us over into the 14th to the end of the 16th century when Japan suffered from over 50 years of uninterrupted strife. In fact, the Japanese themselves, using a Chinese term, call it the period of the country at war, the Sengoku Jidai. One shogun or military dictator named Yoshimitsu found in Buddhism the solace of meditation amidst lavishly simple surroundings and built the Golden Pavilion, the King Kakuji, just outside Kyoto. This was his garden tea house of reflective pleasure, a building of utmost refinement, deceptive simplicity. It was, by the way, burned down completely in 1950 by a deranged youth. And this story has been captured in the great uh, novelist Mishima's Dostoevsky-like novel called The Golden Pavilion. The pavilion, by the way, was faithfully rebuilt in 1958-59, so that now it looks exactly as it did in the uh, 16th century. The next era Americans had become familiar with through the novel by Clavel and the television miniseries called Shogun. It was the period of the great unifiers who put together samurai coalitions and armies and uh, eventually brought about the unification of Japan. And this period featured such heroes as Oda Nobunaga, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and Tokugawa Ieyasu. All are found in fictional form in Clavel's Shogun. Nobunaga set the pace with a vast castle built at Azushi on, the, on Lake Biwa. And soon after, the great o Osaka Castle was started in 1586. It continued, continued the trend. 
Hideyoshi continued uh, with another castle on Peach Hill, in Japanese Momoyama, from which the artistic name uh, uh, is derived. In the course of unification, other castles appeared. Uh, many of them were destroyed in World War II, but one spectacular example is the White Heron Castle in Himeji, with its castle-like architecture suggesting the West, but a curious blend of te Japanese temple style and thus uh, uh, embodying the Eastern tradition. It was functional in a Western sense uh, because it needed to adjust the firearms with sloping uh, roofs and uh, side walls. The superstructures were ornate in the extreme. Roof lines were remind, uh, remindful of the gargoyles of medieval Europe. The wealth and patronage of these great warrior rulers, by the way, was not confined to the outside, but was celebrated in what has been called the Momoyama decorators. They lavished attention on the elaborate interiors, for example, the Nijo Castle in Kyoto. Even more luxurious were the interior hallways, decorated, for example, by the Kano School of Screens. Again, nature always served as the inspiration. Of the three great unifiers, Hideyoshi perhaps was the most baseborn. He was a parvenu, an upstart, under whose lavish patronage Japanese art, perhaps for very boredom after centuries of the stringency of good taste, spread and burgeoned into a more uh, bourgeois style, belying uh, its traditions with obvious relish. It rioted and boasted in gold and in silver. It was, um, uh, it, it displayed wealth almost to a vulgar degree. Uh, the gardens, thus, were quite unlike uh, the traditional Japanese garden. But it's precisely at this point that one must remember that amidst the castles and the screens and the great born, we must pause and remember that the surest indication of the way of life of the people is not only in its great or heroic tradition, but also in its what is called the little tradition. This is the role of folk art, minge where the Japanese were exceptionally strong. And here and there in modern Japan, this tradition is faithfully protected. For example, at uh, Kurashiki in southwestern Japan, a completely reconstructed uh, folk art village. Warner wrote, for the traditional arts make up a rich, crowded seedbed of sturdy plants, out of which an occasional aristocratic giant of the species grows up to top the others. Such giants are significant to us only when they are of the same species as the lowly ones and planted to fulfill our everyday needs. The same is true of architecture. It was in this period that we have the development of the simple, classic Japanese farmhouse, whose style influenced the grander cottage palaces, which we'll see in a moment, and which is now preserved for younger generations to see. Often function dictated the styles, thus in the northern climates, stones were placed on the roof to hold down the shingles. And the influence of earlier Shinto shrine style is still seen in carefully preserved examples, such as the hipped roof to be found in the environment, environs of Kyoto. And there's some superb examples also to be found within an hour of Tokyo in Kawasaki. The period described by Clavel in his novel and in the television uh, series was, however, above all, the period of the Tognala, the family of the Shogun, based in old Edo, which is now modern Tokyo. The Tognala ruled, and the Tognala period lasted for a long period of time, from about 1600 to 1867. During this 250 years of relative isolation and peace, uh, the uh, Japanese uh, had the samurai as a ruling class. They were respected, but uh, they still, and they still celebrate in parades at the present time, uh, the samurai uh, style. More important, uh, with a century and a half of peace and relative isolation, the Japanese were able to refine a characteristic Japanese style, a Japanese way. They melded everything previously adapted from China and from Korea, what they had built up over these many years, and embodied them in the great 
Edo or Tokugawa tradition. And these are best seen in three areas. The area of Zen Buddhism and its artistic influences, particularly in tea and in the tea ceremony and in great exterior gardens. Zen was one of the most interesting phenomena, certainly one of the most significant for art. And when it came about the 13th century, transformed from a Buddhist sect in China and called Zen in Japan, uh, few expected that it would have such an enormous influence. Nothing quite like its effects were felt before the 8th century, or for that matter, uh, ever since. Zen became a cult for a caste, the samurai. It provided certain aesthetic principles for the artist, and it also provided a faith for the illiterate. In the practical matter of putting down their painting in ink on paper, Zen artists discovered the principle of muga. It is not I that am doing this. And this opens the gate for the necessary essential truth to flow in through the brush. When the self does not control the drawing, meaning must. Thus principle runs through Zen teachings, especially where action is involved. It accounts for the very much admired swiftness and sureness of execution with the brush, the complete elimination of detail, the use of white space, the dedication of every component to the essential idea. The style is so abbreviated that nothing remains of embellishment or obvious artistry. The observer is encouraged to enjoy the undoubted delight of exercising his own imaginative powers to grasp the meaning. Perhaps nowhere is this so clear anywhere in the world than in the famous garden called Ryoanji near Kyoto, an abstract temple garden, a Zen masterpiece, a simple, simplified, almost severe stone and moss garden with the hint of a seascape, rock islands, and waves. But hours of contemplation and losing oneself in this composition will surely supply a whole variety of programs, depending upon the observer. Here, indeed, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. The second theme was tea, and tea taste in art, and it was closely related to Zen. So compulsive has become the tea ceremony and perfected in this era that it affected movement, style, pottery, landscape, and interior architecture. In a garden devoted to tea, first of all, great attention is devoted to the entrance, which brings upon one the calm of meditation. Inside a gate, a bench is provided for a brief respite and the removal of one's shoes. As one winds his way down through the garden, he may encounter some old or fine art object, which will be the subject of later quiet conversation over the tea table. The effect uh, of the first view of the chaya or tea house is important. It may resemble a simple mountain hut or a farmhouse or a temple. Above all, it must impress with a sense of simplicity yet elegance, serenity, the mode for tea and contemplation. It is thus a very short step from here to the exterior gardens, which also incorporated the ideas of Zen. These principles lifted to a grand scale produced the often luxurious formal gardens of the great lords, the daimyo. For example, the um, Korakuren of the Ikeda family in Okayama, where all the world seems to be reproduced. A natural but artificial representation of the many features of Japanese life. But the tale in the small is not neglected either. In another of Japan's three most famous of such gardens, this is the one of the daimyo of Kanazawa, the Maeda family, and it's called Kenrokuin, the six combinations. The combinations used are vastness, solemnity, careful arrangement, venerability, coolness, induced by running water, and charm of the scenery. An unusual art object in this garden is the two-legged lantern on the shore of the pond. 
in many people's estimation, this is high art, architecture and landscape decoration, which reaches its climax in two detached palaces uh, quite near the old capital of Kyoto. One is Shugakuin, which in my opinion should always be visited in the fall. It is what Japanese call the period of the Momiji, when the maple leaves begin to turn and express the delicate, the shortness of life, the passing of everything, the fragility of life, the retirement idea, contemplation. The whole atmosphere is designed, especially at the entrance, to introduce one into a kind of silence and quietude. The view from the tea house, which is a very famous piece of architecture called the Rin Umte, is designed to lift the eyes through the glories of nature into the infinity of the blueness beyond. On the other side of uh, Kyoto is Katsura, which is perhaps an even more famous detached palace, which was built for a retired emperor. Its effects on architects, gardeners, landscapers, interior decorators throughout the world is absolutely beyond question. One cannot pick up an interior decoration magazine without seeing the influence of Katsura. Here again, the entrance is made as simple as possible in Zen style, designed to put one in a mood. Another simple yet elegant gate is designed to receive the palanquin, the shoulder-carried hut of the emperor. The most famous structure in Katsura is the Shingoten, the new palace, designed to be deceptively simple and modeled after our old friend, the classic Japanese farmhouse. The interior is elaborately simple and uncluttered. The architecture is built around not to fight against nature. Here is a terrace from which the rising moon can be viewed. The style is also highly functional, as in the case of a series of stones designed to catch falling raindrops in such a way as to tr transmit coolness into the interior. Sometimes human decoration is deliberately introduced to be startling. There is a checkered design, glimpsed through the door. But from the inside, the stark squares set off the simplicity of the natural scene outside. And outside again, all nature is reproduced in miniature. There is more than a hint of a natural bridge, the famous geographic feature in Japan called Amano Hashidate. In all cases, natural materials, wood and stone, are used. A lake and a bridge are seen in the distance. And in this garden, one always feels as though he has a front view. Nearby, on a slight rise, is the tea house, the shokate, which resembles a simple hut on a mountain pass. And while resting there, one can admire the extreme simplicity of the native materials. In the late uh, 17th century and early 18th century, the Tokugawa period produced a remarkable and explosive urban culture centered around Osaka on the one hand and Edo, now Tokyo, on the other. One might conclude from all the art we've discussed so far that it was to preserve the favored few, the court, the daimyo, the shogun, the, the samurai, with little left for the rest. In fact, the Tokugawa period, approaching the time of the arrival of Perry, also saw the flowering of a great urban tradition with a lively lifestyle of the merchant townsmen. This was, in a way, Japan's first expression of a middle-class attitude. And it was perhaps best expressed in the famous Bunraku Puppet Theater, which is still mounted in Osaka. And above all, of course, in Grand Kabuki. It was here on the Kabuki stage where Chikamatsu made his fame as what is called the Shakespeare of Japan. But it all could also be seen, the Kabuki style, in the closely related ukiyo-e, or floating world, woodblock prints. In fact, many of the woodblock prints were originally posters designed for the Kabuki theater. These prints span the entire life of the Edo or Tokugawa era, beginning in the late 17th century and coming down to the time of Commodore Perry's arrival, mid-19th century. 
They were at their height in the urban style called Genroku, about the 17th century. Motonobu, one of the first of the artists who died about 1694, was best known for monochrome prints, describing the bustle and hustle of the Yoshiwara licensed pleasure quarters of the 17th century. His prints were closely identified with kabuki. Among the first of the color prints were the so-called pictures of kaigetsudo beauties, so-called from a studio where artists adopted the family name. This was the portraits of women in stylized form wearing brightly decorated clothing, slightly turned. Uh, this one is by kaigetsudo, and the next one already revealed uh, the influence of Western or Dutch perspective. The cloth fender by Toshinobu, early 18th century, uh, coincides with kabuki in full stride. Indeed, the picture may be of an actor portraying the role of a cloth vendor. One of the first great giants was Harunobu, who invented uh, polychrome printing for New Year's cards. After Harunobu's woodblock prints made great strides, not only in artistic design, but also engraving, came prints such as this one by Shigemasu, portraying the two geishas of the East, the Fukugawa se section of old Edo. Similarly, another artist about 1752 did this print of the two beauties of the South, the Shinagawa section, which is still one of the approaches to downtown uh, Tokyo. But by now, these healthy specimens are, are free from the cloying figures of uh, the past. Toyoharu lived from the 18th to the early 19th century, returned to relief pictures uh, adapted from what he learned from copper engravings and smuggled Dutch books. Uh, one view he thought was of the Netherlands was in fact of Venice. But the two greatest artists were Hokusai, who lived from 1760 to 1849, one of the first of the two great landscapers. This is uh, one of his 34 views of Fuji. And the greatest, and really the last master of this woodblock uh, genre, was Hiroshige, who lived from the late 18th century to 1858. He infused a sense of Japanese lyricism in his depiction of all the natural beauty surrounding man. This night view of Kanazawa by moonlight was one of his last great works. Modern art is, of course, also worthy of attention, but we have necessarily devoted most of our attention to uh, traditional Japanese art. After the Meiji Restoration in the 19th century, and in the sub subsequent periods between the 19th century and the early 20th century, and from 1912 to the present time, art in Japan has been distinguished by the fact that it is powerfully influenced from abroad while maintaining its uh, traditional sources. It's been influenced by Western art, like music. It's very popular. Thus, a Van Gogh exhibition in Kyoto played to a full house with lines of patrons uh, winding around the block. Of course, in shrine architecture, modern style, traditional themes uh, remain apparent. And although they might, on the surface, appear ultra-modern, they also pick up the traditional themes. When an artist, for example, decided to depict the final resting place for the victims of Hiroshima, he chose a very modern stylized form of a very ancient traditional saddle, such as was used in the primitive tombs for Japanese warriors who presumably rode their horses off into infinity. The Tower of Peace in the same plaza is a free form with attached folded cranes, origami, to symbolize peace. But the shape remarkably resembles our friend the lantern in Kanazawa's Kenrokuen Park. And when Tange Kenzo, Japan's greatest modern architect, built the 1964 Olympic edifices, uh, the stadium, for example, he combined a modern freestyle with the massive tomb style of primitive Japan. In similar fashion, the Tocho, the headquarters of the Tokyo Metropolitan Government in downtown Tokyo, 
is from a distance an ultra-modern stainless steel structure. But in a sense, up close, it is also a memorial to the castle architecture of Edo, complete with a statue of Otadokan, the samurai founder of Edo. On the wall of the main entryway is a very large modern abstract painting, perhaps symbolizing the dynamic complexity of the world's largest cities.